Okay. Am I up there? Yep. Okay, let's go to the beginning. All right. So uh, thanks everybody for showing up. I do appreciate all your time. Uh, we're gonna try to stay on target and on task. We've got about 50 minutes, then we'll open it up for questions. So as we move through this, if you have any questions, feel free to just ping nil, I guess, and then someone will uh, let me know, and then we can uh, answer that if possible. So for everyone that is here tonight, we're going to make this PowerPoint available to you for free so that you can utilize it for crew training or to utilize it in your companies, however you see best fit, modify it, however, feel free. I just want for individuals to be able to take this information and spread it around. Uh, so here we go. Uh, what is efficiency? And in the tree world, that's uh, always the question is the difference between time, money, energy. All those things are definitely efficiencies that we need to build into not only the, the how we look at the jobs to how we perform the jobs as well. Uh, being efficient can be making sure that the trucks arrive on the correct side of the street, making sure that the client knows that the gates need to be open. And there's a lot of things that work into that. And as we talk about rigging systems, we're going to talk about the efficiencies in each one of them as we move through. Communication plus teamwork equals safety. That is something that is absolutely pivotal, uh, pivotal for the tree, tree world. I've been doing a lot of cases here lately. Communication seems to be the biggest breakdown between accidents and injuries and our industry. So it's important that we communicate from the highest point all the way to the working individuals in the field, starting with salesmen and working from there. So we'll talk about it as we move through. This is more of not only for the tree guys in the field, but as the sales individual starts the entire process, that will give enough information for the tree crew to know what they're about to get into before they show up on the job. So the outer perimeter survey is anything that if the tree fell over, it's normally considered one times the height of the tree. There's utilities or other obstacles. It could be 1.5, two times the height. So that's something that we would look at full 360 degrees to determine how we're gonna get the tree off the house. How are we going to lower it away from power lines? And the outer perimeter survey, that information needs to be cataloged and then correlated to the tree crew before they ever show up on site. This is one that, this is a proposal, I just took a, a clip of it, that I give to my tree crews and we, each one of the photographs is able to be enlarged. So then the tree crew knows, okay, well, we're going to a property that's got a long driveway, is the driveway circular. It gives them the ability to start asking questions before they ever get there. They know it's gonna be a single family residence. They know that it's got utilities above ground and below ground, and it's got a mild slope. So before they get there, if the truck has got some kind of issues or where maybe you need a few extra wheel chalks, you already know before you get there where I live at here in Gainesville with all the lake properties, that's critical information as some of the properties are so steep that uh, they're inaccessible with some of the vehicles that we have. And once that has been cataloged and then correlated onto the, the however you do your work, work invoice or you're, if you're on the site as a crew member, you're doing your pre-work assessments. Then once we've determined it's safe to enter underneath the tree, we do our inner perimeter survey. And on the outer perimeter survey, we're starting to build this rigging plan as well. And as we move closer in, we're starting to be able to understand how, how structurally sound is this tree? Not only are the, the outside hazards, electrical utilities, deadwood, those, those types of hazards being taken into consideration. Now we're looking at the strength of the stem, plus the strength of the root system. So this was a tree I went resistograph. There was nothing in there. It was, it, was, uh, it was completely void, plus it had a gigantic root. So that's the kind of scenario that the tree crew needs to know before they ever leave. This is a, a very precarious situation that's gonna need a lot of extra equipment. Not only does it have a gigantic canopy. I've seen a lot of scenarios and I've worked with a lot of companies that one, the other, showed up to do work, they have one gigantic diameter rope and one gigantic diameter rigging block, and that's it. And they're supposed to do a, a tree that's hung up between two or three other, other trees. 
So they definitely were not informed before they, they made it there. We're looking for potential hazards. And when we're dealing with rigging, rigging is a, you're either supporting a union or a compromising a union. And if your union is already compromised through some kind of stress, strain, tear, rip, fracture, then we, we need to know before we get there, maybe this is a scenario where you need ratchet straps, binding, chains, other kinds of material to hold this tree together if you do have to, to work it down as parts. Uh, the inner perimeter survey also includes a lot of information of up close photographs of the tree to go out to the crew if possible, and then giving specific information of what is going to actually occur when you get there. It's this tree is being pruned or this tree is being removed. If you're going to a property that has several hundred thousand dollars worth of landscaping, it could be the difference between a successful day and a day that costs you lots of money as a tree owner uh, of replacing trees that were incorrectly removed. So GPS works great if you have a scenario where you've got multiple trees on a property that are in question. GPS does work really well. Uh, also, it helps keep the client uh, on the same track of where you're at, where they think that, oh, I thought you were gonna cut down 60 of those trees. No, it's one tree. And so that way it doesn't, leave into any kind of weird legal issues where they thought something was going to take place that didn't. Uh, uh, on the information that's going to the crew, also that's being communicated with the crew on site, it's very, very important. There are electrical lines everywhere, possibly below ground as well. Those need to be indicated before the tree crew goes to the site because uh, we have a high voltage safety act that legally requires the utility companies to offer some form of mitigation strategy to deal with trees and utility conflicts. I've seen scenarios with, with utility-based companies, that's their job, that's what they're insured for, that's what they're trained and licensed and bonded in some cases to do. And so there's normally not that, that kind of, we need to have a mitigation option because they are in some cases the mitigation option. But as a residential company, you may not be insured or bonded to be working within the same tolerances, and we'll talk about that in a second, as those utility-based companies. So it's important to know before we go out, we have a three-phase power line. That's probably not your apprentice-grade removal. That's going to be something for a more seasoned veteran climber or lift operator. Uh, potential hazards, electricals, a really big one as we talk about rigging because in general, with rigging, most things are moving in a circular motion away from their origin point, and utility lines can be contacted, allowing the, the energy to transfer through the tree, causing uh, electrocutions, shock, uh, the entire gamut could occur. So if you know whether or not you're a qualified line clearance arborist or not, it should be very easy. Someone would have given you a qualification either in a card or a training that would have said, yes, this individual is qualified to work with inside either distance A or distance B, but those are called the minimum approach distance. And depending on your qualification, that is how close not only you as your person, but any part of the tree, that's the sweep of the branches in a downward motion, that's uh, rigging parts, pieces, the tagline being pulled away from the tree as a branch is being lowered. Those parts and pieces and distances have to be quantified to determine what is the, the distance of operation. Your, the minimum approach distance is per qualification. And the qualification would be through years of experience, documentation, and testing. And if you don't have those things, and your company is licensed to be working around utility lines, then you're considered a non-qualified person, whether you may have 20 years or not, your company is the one who qualifies you to work around utility lines and ensures the company to be able to operate with those. So for most of our voltages here in the area, you're going to have a minimum approach distance of 10 feet. That is super easy to breach those distances with the tips of branches or entire branches or stem pieces. Uh, guy wires are always in play because of the machines that operate. So we have to make sure we keep 
parameters through those. Now, if you're a qualified line clearance arborist, the distance is much, much closer. That also can lead to a, bit, a, a lot of different safety factors where you could have energy transferring through the tree into the ground. It's, it's not advisable if you have to work within those close proximity to, to utilize really a, a rigging system that's going to allow branches to stick onto the power lines. You should be able to chip away those branches with uh, dielectrically safe tools before you ever put yourself in a situation where possibly not only the operator that's a lot, but the ground personnel becomes energized because of a rigging system holding a branch that's on a, a power line. So we're moving through this very quickly so we can get to the, uh, the rigging parts of it. But these are really important parts and pieces of building the system for the crew makes it. And then whenever the crew is on site, uh, if you do have a utility interface that can't be worked upon safety, safely, you have to call the utility company. A utility mitigation plan has to be authorized. Uh, here where I live at Gainesville, sometimes they will do it for free. Sometimes they want to charge. It really depends on the situation, but that's not my problem. That's the client's problem and we, we pass it on to them. So uh, once we're into the guts of the, the information that the crew gets, they need to know, is it a dead tree? Is it a live tree? What's going on? We're going to, this is a, proposal that goes to my crew members. They, they know that there's no aerial utilities. The tree is dead. It does have decay. It's got damaged root flare. It's got dead roots. And so that gives them the, the pretext before they ever make it to the job that if we rig this tree, we have to either rig it really, really small, or we need to figure out a way to be able to drop pieces of this tree without rigging it because that means that the structural failure point that my arborist saw as he was looking at this tree is the, going to be ground level with it being the dead root. So that's the primary uh, failure point. And having a, a rigging point break out in two inch diameter wood can be catastrophic. Having a rigging point break that is the entire base of the tree is definitely catastrophic because you can have tree 100, 200 feet in a full 360 degree range falling wherever it wants to at that point. Now, once we've gotten correct information, we're making it to the job site with the crew. Once we're on the job site, everybody has to understand where are we at and where is the closest medical facility in case something happens. These are our crew safety procedures so that then we can identify once we know where we're at and what we're doing from the initial job assessment, if something goes wrong, what is the nearest place of, of assistance? What are the hazards we see on the jobs? What are the procedures we're going to follow to deal with those hazards? What kind of emergency procedures and protocols are we going to follow if the procedures were somehow fail and lead to an incident on the workplace? This is one that goes out with every job, with every crew. It allows tracking of job hours. Also, if we have any kind of weird specialty information that needs to go, such as we had a utility drop, the utility information goes on there. So that way they get the service drop back up. In general, it's way cheaper to have a service drop taken down than it is to burn the house down of your client. So uh, big, Big safety concerns, big inefficiencies on the job is the tree crew shows up without the understanding of how to deal with the environment that they're actually working in. Uh, with the, the environment that you're working in is how do we deal with the tra traffic? That's one of the big things. In general, the trucks are gonna be in the road for at least a period of time. I see in some cases in urban areas, 20, 30, 40 minutes on a job of goes to waste when you're doing the truck rodeo in the street because either the sales individual didn't let someone know that you've got different backing in from the road preferences or you get there the gate's not open because something wasn't conveyed and then a big misconception is oh we can just park in the road we can just throw some cones out and it's no problem in the state of Georgia if you're operating and you're somehow diverting traffic from its normal operating lane you're responsible for the safety of that traffic. So if you're diverting traffic into another lane, you need to have someone out there. Also, if you have potential shrapnel flying into the road, dead pieces, debris, 
traffic control must be implemented. And uh, also, whenever we're building these traffic control procedures, we need to keep in mind that it is much safer in most cases to chip from the, the curb side instead of the street side. So that could be uh, sometimes moving the truck three or four different times whenever I worked in Athens. Sometimes the trucks would be on one street for part of the day, a different street for a part of the day. And so knowing and pre-planning all that out with the crew and putting it in your pre-hazard assessment where everybody knows, okay, once we're down to the trunk wood, the chipper truck needs to go out. The flatbed truck needs to move in. That helps save sometimes hours on the job. Uh, also, when we're building the parameters of how we're working and dealing with the rigging scenario, we're not only worried about the person aloft, we're also worried about the persons that are on the ground. And so in every case, when we're setting up rigging operations, we need to have the mindset that parts, pieces could fall out of the tree, either controlled or uncontrolled. So we need to always have a safety factor that we build in depending on the conditions of the site and the conditions of the tree that gets all of our ground personnel out of the drop zone because the drop zone is not a work zone. They're either one or the other. And we'll talk about that in a second. But on this particular picture, what you're looking at is the, the GRCS, that's Greg Good, the inventor of the GRCS, is standing at a really uh, a much further distance than having the GRCS at the base of the tree, utilizing just a simple redirect above the GRCS, creating lift, pulling a, a dead tree over. So he's out of the drop zone of any parts of that tree that are falling, or if that tree hits another tree, uh, if those parts fall out. So that's what's being built into the, the systems. And so this is how that scenario works. And so this is a form of rigging is getting the ground individuals away from the trunk of the tree. Uh, may involve more pieces of gear than you could have on your normal working truck. Uh, for me personally, whenever I go out to do work and you'll see some pictures as we move on of jobs I've done, I always carry lots and lots of gear. I have four small blocks, two big blocks, a plethora of slings of all different sizes and shapes. I carry tons of little slings of all different sizes and shapes because in general, I normally don't know if I'm doing contract work, what I'm getting into when I get there, but they're not calling me for easy stuff and it always involves rigging. So what we're looking at in this picture is that you have at least two redirect points and then a lowering device. So that's three individual parts of gear, excluding the rigging line itself. Uh, this also, as we move further on, has some really advantageous benefits of loading the stem in compression, not in torsion. One of the things to think about too in a rigging scenario, also a climbing scenario, is that there's lots and lots of rope all over the job site. The rope must at all cost be maintained and kept in an orderly fashion free of machines, chainsaws, and especially chippers. So this is the parameters that if a piece of rope goes into a Vermeer 1800 series chipper, the chipper will pull 172 feet of rope in in one second. So you have no chance to resolve the issue if the rope goes into the chipper. That could hit the grounds persons, that could rip the tree apart, that could rip the rigging out of the tree. There's a million things that could go wrong with that scenario. So efficiency on the job site, bag your ropes always, or put them on a tarp, flake them into the same position. Uh, that way you're able to keep them out of the site. I see a lot of horrible rigging scenarios where just there's ropes everywhere. Every time you rig something, it gets called in the ropes and two or three people are fighting it out. Uh, before we build in the rigging systems and efficiencies, we just needed to know a little bit about basic rigging dynamics. Uh, we should always, before we build a rigging system, know what we're dealing with. The green log weight chart is a great place to start with that so we can understand how big of a piece of wood the gear will handle and then we can then look at the condition of the tree, unions, decay, disease, root failure, those things, and then build from the highest possible point, what are we actually comfortable with? And then we'll know, 
because just, to, just because you can take a 10,000 pound piece doesn't mean that that tree can handle a 10,000 pound piece of wood. So those parts and pieces have to be calculated in there. Uh, because trees are, are always going to be stronger on the compression side more than the, the tension side. So, sorry, uh, trees are always going to be twice as strong on the compression side and uh, not the tension side. It's, uh, so it's, it's really, really difficult to pull a board apart. So that becomes the issue. If you're dealing with unions and you're trying to uh, deal with a union that's got included bark, included wood in there where that union possibly could come apart we need to make sure that if we're loading on a side or a lateral branch that we take in consideration that those compression fibers that are down there could, could buckle. So we need to possibly put in some form of redirect or multi-block system to deal with the compression fibers. So that way they don't buckle. Then, then once the compression fibers start buckling and then your tension fibers can, can be pulled out. Uh, so when we're rigging in a basic rigging scenario, we're going to always be doubling the weight of the load on the union. That's just the basic principle. So if we're looking at our rigging scenario and we go, well, the, everything says that we're rated for 10,000 pounds. Uh, well, if you took a 10,000 pound piece of wood, then that means that the union that you just dropped that into saw you know, 20,000 pounds up, up and up. It can just continue going up depending on a lot of other factors. So no matter what, you always base the, the simplest math on if I'm loading 100 pounds of wood, the anchor on the other side has to be able to hold 100 pounds. So can my ground person hold this piece of wood? If you have a 110 pound ground person and you're dropping a 100 pound piece of wood, there's a high probability that that piece of wood is going to go through whatever you're trying to protect because it's gonna be really difficult for that other person to deal with that weight, including the extra forces that are generated with it dropping. So the union is going to see 200% or two times. That changes and increases depending on fall factor. So that's the length of the fall divided by the length of the rope. So if we're thinking of a climbing scenario, that's more of the left-hand chart. So the closer you get to the anchor point on a static system, the more energy is in the system. The, the side to the right is more of a rigging scenario that if you took a piece of wood and dropped it from where it's at, starting at 100 pounds, it's going to increase in magnitude if you try to stop it closer to the ground. So that's why having someone who can let it run, feather the weight out, you wanna to try to keep the energy potential as low as possible through the entire rigging scenario to make sure that you're more, more strongly supporting the tree through building the system around the tree. So earlier when we were talking about that, dealing with the compression loading of trees, this is normally how I deal with it in a basic tree scenario, is I make the tree work for itself by adding multiple blocks in the system. So I'm loading the stems and compression instead of them ripping out of the side of the tree. Uh, we see the same kind of system in suspension bridges and trestle bridges all around the world. So it's, it's a known, known kind of system. We also see it in nature when trees have to deal with lots and lots of stress, they put this in. And if you see my, my trigonometry presentations, I cover a lot more into that. So now let's talk about equipment and being efficient. So we've talked about dynamics. We're adding multipliers depending on how we rig into the tree. So the equipment we utilize uh, can help us take out some of those unknowns of if we run over natural bark six or seven times, then how is the piece going to run? Uh, and if we're dealing with efficiencies in the tree, having a constant friction point in the tree allows us to be able to take consistent loads over and over and over again, much quicker. So my goal as a climber is to be able to take the biggest possible piece for the size of area and as quickly as possible. I think that's what everybody's wanting to go for. I became a tree person before there were really the track lift world. There wasn't a, a lot of information about the dynamics of rigging pieces of wood. I 
and still to this point, I rigged small pieces and lots and lots of them really, really quickly because we didn't even have many skids when I started in 1999, I guess it was. And so we always had to manually move anything that made it to the ground away. So we would rig a piece of 50 inch diameter wood when I worked at Arbor Guard in Atlanta. You rig this 50 inch diameter piece of wood, it took you one hour to rig it and it takes one hour for them to process it, move that away. So now that things are able to be much quicker processed on the ground, these things are much working much, much better and more uh, advantageous to the entire crew because now you can actually move the things. So rigging big pieces of wood is something that happens more often. To the left, we've got a porter wrap, very expensive. Uh, to, the, to the right, we have the GRCS, a little bit more expensive. Each one of them is, is good for what they are. As far as efficiencies go on the ground, I prefer the GRCS if I have to do any kind of real tree work because in most cases, I'm gonna be doing some lifting through the process because you can lift a much bigger piece because the variables are constant compared to dropping them. Uh, something that came out several years ago that's really awesome are ringed slings. These have a large ring, small ring, so you can pull them from the ground. Uh, in general, I set these aloft either from the lift or while climbing. Uh, these are easy to retrieve. So normally what this would be is sort of the first point because they aren't as efficient as a block. And if I feel like I'm gonna be pulling something out from the ground later on, I'll put these in instead. Uh, in general, if you're going to be retrieving them from the ground, you can only pull one at a time. So I would leave one as my primary bottom point maybe, and then uh, you have to manually retrieve all the other ones if that's going to work. Uh, as you can see with the rings, they are different sizes bigger wood, smaller wood. Advantage, they go around open unions really, really well. Disadvantage, they don't go around stems very well. And with rope dynamics, anytime you bend a rope, you decrease strength. So tying this thing in a knot is probably not the most preferred method. If you can't put a, a put it through as a, a, a uh, hitch on itself where it has girthed through, I, you're probably going to be losing some strength. I use a lot of chain reactors, which are individually sewn webs of, of high, high strength material. So it's bigger than the normal chain reactor. These are uh, rigging chains. Uh, what you see is a rigging chain with a rigging carabiner and a pulley. Uh, this is utilized more as secondary or third points through the tree, not primary points. The a pulley is not designed to take a a heavy load dropped into it. They're designed more for a consistent load. So in general, I have one of these on my harness at all times if I'm doing rigging as more of the second or third placement when I'm out in the, the field. And so that's, that's a scenario where I would use this as I'm going to redirect and move this rigging point to a different part in the tree. Uh, I prefer smaller blocks if I have the capability. Uh, if I have to use bigger blocks, I install them while climbing into the tree and then try not to install them while I'm on climbing spikes or dealing with uh, big wood. I try to add them while I'm ascending and have a nice ascent system going. Uh, this is a, a screw block with a chain reactor. And when you're attaching gear to trees, it's really personal preference. I have found to be more efficient on smaller diameter wood in that six to 12 inch diameter range using the rigging chains, which are more of the, the two bottom left ones. If I get into wood that is 24 inches diameter and larger, I always move to ice slings because they're designed for a larger weight in general. Uh, they're rated for more but I have a lot of different sizes to help me not have to tie a 30 foot sling around a 24 inch diameter wood. So just keep that in mind. If you only have one, you're probably working really hard to make it that one sling fit. Uh, loopy slings work really well. They're not easy to move. So if I'm using a loopy sling that's over here to the right, normally I'm gonna place that and leave it for an extended period of time I try not to go to the same places more than once or twice in the tree. When you're dealing with rigging and, and efficiency in rigging, uh, there's a lot of different kinds of rigging lines. They all do practically the same thing. They control load to the ground. 
I use the smallest possible rope until I need to use the next size rope. So I'll change ropes out sometimes two or three different times in the tree instead of trying to rig little branches with a five eighths rope. I'll start out with a half inch or a nine sixteenths rope. And for the majority of the areas where I work at here, I can do the majority of the work with a nine sixteenths rope. So uh, the, to your left, you have three strand. Three strand works really well if you have to natural union a piece of wood. This uh, next one is a 12 strand that works so so but uh, you really need to have that in some form of friction management device because it's got too many fibers and the fibers are going to cook and melt and ruin the rope. Uh, the one to your right, which is a double braid style rope, double carrier rope, that is 100% should be utilized at all times through some kind of friction management device. If you get long streaks of glazing on that rope, you can calculate that as strength loss per circumference. And that is sort of give you an idea of, I used to be able to rig 6,000 pounds. Now I can rig maybe 2,000 pounds before you blow the cover of the rope off. Uh, when you're dealing with all this equipment in the tree, it needs to be stored on the harness somehow where it's easy to get to. These are the three things I have on my harness is I've got a paddle gate style that locks that I put big slings in and other gear. I've got a shim beaner and I put gear that's heavy that I know that's not going to fall off of it. I've never had anything fall off of it, uh, but I always make sure because it's non-closed, non I don't put a, a chainsaw on that particular one unless it's the secondary point. Uh, so, that's uh, the one to your left, the Rock Exotica is a non-nosed carabiner. So hollow braid kinds of cordages come out of that a lot quicker and a lot easier without getting picked. If you look at the one in the middle, it's got a little nose on there. Your double braids, chain reactors and things like that will come out of there much easier. Sometimes hollow braids, like three quarter inch hollow braids will get stuck in there. Sometimes it's a little bit of a pain. The thing to the right is a lanyard management clip. Uh, when you're dealing with the rigging, sometimes you need a lanyard that's 10 or 15 feet long, sometimes even longer for bigger diameter wood. Keeping that managed is going to be ticket. So have some form of lanyard management system. Uh, and when we're talking about uh, carrying things around, if I'm doing rigging, I always carry a couple of extra web slings. So what was happening here was I was a little concerned that this piece was going to break and leave shrapnel on the roof. So uh, I sometimes, instead of making a billion half hitches all the way through this piece of wood, all the way to the end of it, to try to protect this broken piece of wood from shrapneling down, I'll add web slings with carabiners like in a rock climbing scenario and make the cut much further back so that if pieces come apart, they stay trapped. So that does save you a little bit of time. Also, if you needed to, you can always use them as a very quick rigging point that's further out on the stem. Uh, this is a project I did in Lake Placid last year. It was negative seven and it was like hide outs the entire time. So we were rigging white pines, lots and lots and lots of white pines. So instead of tying a knot every single time where the grounds persons would have to untie that, I used web slings, non-locking carabiners, the carabiners were actually freezing flows. Uh, the reason I use a big open loop like that on the rigging line, that's a, that's a bowline with the Yosemite tie off, is in some cases I'd have five or six different web slings all hooked in there, sending down pieces of, of wood. So uh, it's much quicker to go to the top of the pine tree one time and set up your primary tying point, a couple feet below that, set up your primary rigging point than it is to try to rig off 100 individual single rigging points. Now, all that gear that we looked at, uh, it is only as good as the user. This is a block that uh, while being utilized, either opened up on its own or was incorrectly locked and opened up. So that's why earlier when we were talking about crew communication, we go all the way back to here and talk about crew safety. The biggest part of this is, sorry guys, hang on with me there is communication strategies and talking about what is going to occur. 
Uh, what I found with communication strategies is that you need to identify uh, how are we going to communicate if it's negative seven and it's wide out, you can't hear anything. Probably we need to have some form of communication headset. I found it saves hours on the job being able to communicate from the air to the ground person without screaming over all the chainsaws and it makes things go a lot easier. Uh, then also, once we are identifying all those communication strategies as earlier, we would talk through our work procedures of who's doing what, the crew task, work zones and drop zones. Each one of those gets identified because your work zone is gigantic, your drop zone is much smaller. Your work zone could really encompass two or three different city blocks if you've got trucks all over the place. That's now a work zone. It needs to have the same cones and other kinds of uh, protections. So uh, that communication strategy is also important of going like, hey, this branch that I've got up here, I'm going to add a few extra pieces because I'm pretty sure as it hits the trunk, it's going to shrapnel down on top of you. That gives the ground personnel the ability to get away from it. And also having this kind of scenario where we have a brand new block fail, it's also important that those individuals have some form of communication strategy of when do I enter underneath the tree? Do I enter underneath the tree as soon as you're running the chainsaw or do I enter underneath the tree as the piece is two feet from the ground or 10 feet from the ground? All that needs to be established before the fact. Um, so to get into the tree, even if I'm doing a removal, uh, I still use the same kinds of ascent systems. I have, uh, Normally, I put a pair of spikes on. I put my foot ascender over the top of my right foot spike. I use my knee ascender. I utilize that same system if I'm going up and down the rope. Mostly, I climb a uh, single rope anyway. But it's real important that you cannot do work and you can't be efficient if you're not in the tree. It takes you 45 minutes or an hour to get to the top of the tree to put in your rigging. You're probably going to do a pretty poor job rig rigging and take bigger pieces than what you should have because you're tired. So uh, rigging is the, the absolute pinnacle of the marathon because you're starting out sometimes in the shade, you're ending up with a full sun on your back and you're cooking. So being efficient, moving up and down the tree is going to be important. Another thing I carry with me is to deal with these uh, moving through the tree scenarios is I carry one chain reactor with one uh, double auto locking carabiner. And I utilize, if I use any kind of redirect, I always use a clove hitch redirect, which gives me a lot more safety that if something fails in the tree, that I'm now just going to primary load that unless I just absolutely need it. Uh, this is one of the biggest trees I ever removed down in Puerto Rico. It took me 20 hours. It was eight foot diameter. Uh, that's it was four or five hour days of actual time in the tree. You can see down here below, I've got my spikes on. I've got my uh, foot ascender. I also, if I'm doing big wood all the time with big chainsaws, I wear a chest harness. This is a rock climbing one uh, that allows me to be able to hang all, all the extra slings and loopies without it dragging my harness off my butt. And also my chest harness hooks to the back of my climbing harness. So that way the three foot bar on the chainsaw and the chainsaw weight doesn't pull my harness down the entire time. Also, uh, I carry waters because it's important, but you can see through this entire process, this was an eight foot diameter tree. I only have really one web sling. That's, that's all I carry with me and a handsaw. I need a chainsaw, one web sling and a, a handsaw to make most things happen because with big trees and with trying to do like open canopy work, if you've got a dead piece inside a tree, these scenarios all take place, is that somehow you need to be able to get the rope up the tree cleanly and get the piece out of the tree cleanly. So that normally incorporates utilizing blocks. And then when we talk about the angle of deflection, this can be utilized either that this is two individual trees or a union in a tree. But by using two blocks in the tree, we now are squeezing those two unions together. So then if we get into scenarios where we've got gigantic uh, amounts of load with poor rope angles, we can use the angle of deflection, which is what this is called really, and using multiple blocks and slings to be able to support the canopy of the tree 
and to be able to hold the amount of weight that we need to be able to hold. Uh, you can see this has got ratchet straps. It's got everything in the world holding it together. Uh, so if you don't have the equipment, you can't really do the work. So I'm not an equipment salesman, but as you can see, most of these scenarios require at least two blocks and some form of lowering device. Uh, and when we're building these rigging dynamics, the most important part, and this will be available for you, it's got a bunch of slides and data blocked out. You can go back in there, read it, share it with your crews. I hope that you're able to use this next sections to sort of show people, hey, this is how I think it should go down on the site. Uh, this is my thought process and what do you think about it as a more of a training tool. But in rigging dynamics, the highest point that you have as a rigging point is always going to see the most load. So for this scenario, if we have our ground anchor at block one, if we go directly over 90 degrees to block two, these two, piece, these two blocks are going to see about the same amount of weight. But as we move up to block two, this block one is going to see more uh, or sorry, block two is going to see more. As we move down, block one is going to see more. So whatever the highest point is, it's going to see more load. The, the lowest point is going to see less. Uh, Phil Kelly and I did a huge research project about this using dynamometers and testing lots of things. So uh, baseline, what we can see is the highest point sees the most load and it works. This is that chart from earlier. So I'll let you look at it a little bit later on on your own. We're going to be moving on. All right, here's the nuts and bolts of it. Climbing and rigging and being efficient. Uh, generally, your climbing system needs to be as high as possible in the tree that's safe, safe enough that can support your weight so you can move, uh, if possible, 360 degrees, which doesn't happen, but you want the most mobility possible. So once you've established where your rigging point is or your climbing point is, then you establish where your rigging points are. Rigging is going to make the climbing point move. So it's important that the rigging point also is in a very stationary or static part in the tree. So that way when you're rigging, it doesn't pull the climber all over the tree. Uh, also, as you see, as I'm moving laterally to set up the next point of rigging, uh, I also have to think in that the angle of deflection from the rope coming from the ground out where I'm at possibly could rub at some point against my primary climbing line. Uh, the fastest moving rope is always going to cut the slow moving rope. So it's important. That's why also your climbing point is above. Your rigging point is to help protect the climbing line from getting rubbed with the rigging line. Uh, multiple time points are always a great tool, uh, especially when you're rigging, because as you see on this picture to the left and the picture to the right, that's Rick Dembo there on the right helping me at, on the botanical garden. This tree was awful. It leaned at about 70 degrees and had a real wacky top. And so while rigging, he needed something to help stabilize him. This is the same scenario in the picture to the left is when you're rigging branch pieces of wood down, it's way easier to have a second form of tie-in point so that way you're not standing on the side of the stem. When you're moving through the tree and rigging, remember if you fall, uh, you're always going to go at some point back to finish up this rigging triangle or climbing triangle. So keep in mind, if you're rigging and you're leaving stubs, you're creating a potential for impalement hazards for yourself. So in general, whether you're doing a pine tree or a big oak, cut things as flush as possible if the entire tree is being removed. If it's not, then you don't have to worry about that because you made a, a boriculturally correct pruning cut. So the difference between this last picture is if I fell in this scenario, probably a pretty gradual soft fall. Uh, in this next scenario, this is a much steeper angle from the climber from the time point to where the climber is. So if you fall from this point, say for some reason, heaven forbid, you cut your lanyard with a handsaw or with a climbing or with a chainsaw and you took a fall, that's a pretty catastrophic fall back to that angle. Uh, so you have to always keep in mind as well that your rigging systems, moving systems, chainsaw systems, uh, those systems okay uh, I'm not sure what happened there let's see if we can get Otis back got a question uh, sorry Otis um, your network cut out there after the catastrophic fall from okay. the 45 degree angle. Am I back up now? Yep. 
Okay. All right. We're going to keep on moving here. Uh, so when we're rigging, also keep in mind the pendulum effect that the rigging piece needs to be able to clear the climber or lift. Lift is even worse in a lot of cases, and we'll talk about that in a second, that you can't get away from the piece of wood. Uh, when we're rigging from lifts, whether we're doing it with a crane or manual, we have to keep in mind we have outriggers, we've got machines operating. Uh, the work zone in a lot of times is way, way tighter than what we would ever want. Uh, we also have to keep in mind that any part of this lift could not branches free, debris free. Uh, also, just as a word of safety, all chainsaws need to be supported while aloft, whether they're climbing or while in a lift to pre prevent them from falling to the ground. Uh, remember, if you're rigging it, there's a reason that you're working in real tight areas. This is another aerial lift that we utilize uh, up in the mountains in New York uh, to be able to get into to places. This is a white pine rigging scenario. Every branch has to be rigged off. Then we use a gin pole technique to be able to move wood from one point to the next. So uh, anytime possible, we would always utilize one tree to rig the stem wood of another tree into it if it's feasible. These two happen to be what we would consider feasible because the trunk wood from tree left going to trunk wood tree right didn't really pose a huge hazard if something catastrophically failed and it fell straight down, it wouldn't fall onto a house or anything else that would require a backup system. This is a kind of scenario where you may end up needing a backup system because as you see, we have an operator and a lift, we've got it supported at the ground. We may end up using two to three other different systems that we would need to install to be able to prevent that from flipping back over on the lift. Uh, always when we're dealing with the lift, we have to keep in mind that those pieces have got to go somewhere in general, it's way easier to rig 100 little pieces than one gigantic piece and just swamp the groundman for five hours. Always efficiencies dealt with uh, rot rotating devices if possible. This is a big factor I've seen in lots of accidents here lately. The majority of accidents that occur while operating lifts occur when the boom is being operated at 75% and above of its operating range. That means that you're fully stretched out with nowhere left to go. Like in this scenario where you've got a huge top, you're completely stretched out. So that means any of your escape points are gonna be very fast because now you're working instead of having upper lower boom uh, moving really slow, you now have a gigantic lever arm that's completely straight. So any rotational force is magnified. Uh, so we see it not only with things above the lift, is also we see it while taking things that are above the lift with the bucket lower as well. So it doesn't have to be fully extended in the upward position. This boom is fully extended in the uh, sideways or lateral position. You could imagine the, the hazard that occurs by taking one gigantic piece because now we've got an area of possible hazard that is huge compared to taking multiple smaller pieces. So more sometimes is, is not the best scenario. When dealing with spars, try to set up a high tying point. Now we're gonna use uh, some of these, uh, all right here. Okay, uh, let me turn that off. So as, as you move through, now we're getting into how systems are formulated real quickly as we move through this. Rigging on a spar, as the piece moves over from the top, we have backward force and then we have forward force. Keep that in mind. It is much safer to have the rope going from block one to a ground anchor directly below it, compressing the stem in two forms than it is to have the ground anchor move further out to the side because then what you've got is that you're pulling the tree over instead of loading in a compression form. I see this a lot with light rigging, such as small pine tree branches where you've got a rigging point and small branches. That's not necessarily would be considered critical. This is a, a real critical scenario when you're rigging big wood. Uh, if you do have to rig big wood on the spar, it's much quicker and easier to go ahead and set up your second block before you get going. This is a scenario if you have to rig real big wood on the spar, where you use three different blocks, one at the ground as a redirect, one being the primary block that you would normally use second block on the piece of wood moving over. It's easier to set this up where you set up block one, cut the notch, set up block two, 
reeve the rope from block one through block two, terminating it back above block one. And that gives you the ability to create mechanical advantage in the rigging system, which decreases the amount of force on these, these points. Uh, you're still getting uh, the same on these two bottom points, but it decreases how much force goes into the upper blocks. Uh, this is a rigging, this is the climbing system I utilize while on a spar. What I've got is always second form of fall protection, primary climbing system so I can get to the ground. Uh, this is a rope wrench scenario where I could take the rope wrench, put it in my redirect and drag it down. Uh, either way, you need to have either a moving or a non-moving system on a spar. Uh, I like to cut if possible. This is a rigging one. As you can see, there's a millisecond that the tree is completely or the piece is weightless. Uh, I like to have the chainsaw completely stored if possible to make sure that I'm not getting hit. Also for efficiency, sometimes it's way safer to go ahead and pre-tie and butt rig that piece at the stump before you cut it and it rolls down the hill, causing you four or five hours of digging it out of a trench or someone's front door. So pre-rig, uh, this is a clove hitch with a running bullet. Load transfers, this sometimes uh, can be very complicated, but helps a lot. Scenario one, load transfer from tree one to tree two, the tree where the piece is being moved. This is not controlled. This is a lot of dynamics. The pieces fall. Uh, a huge amount of force can be put into block one. You can control that very quickly with the second block, a little bit more complicated. Uh, I did a big test years ago. And you can look at all this data later on. Uh, what we found is whenever you start taking gigantic pieces in these kinds of scenarios, it's really, really easy to overload both the system that the lift operator or the climber is in and the secondary system too. So make sure you're keeping in the pieces at moderate sizes so smaller is better. This whole load transfer kinds of systems also work on the ground. Sometimes it's way more efficient to remove the entire tree off the house than it is to cut it in 500 pieces. Uh, whenever we're, if possible, you can take a much bigger piece by rigging upwards. But if we don't position the rope correctly, like this scenario is that the rope is more in the middle, we try to lift that, that piece is going to turn on a pendulum, possibly hitting the climber lift operator. We can also use those same kinds of systems earlier that we were using to drop bigger wood into and create more lift if we have a scenario where we've got too heavy of a tree to be able to lift with. Uh, a one rope system. So what we've got is a termination block on the tree back to a second block and down. Uh, cutting branches to lift parallel to the ground, perpendicular to the branch, 80% the face diameter lets us be able to lift. Not being able to correctly notch a branch for lifting is catastrophic because if the branch breaks off, sorry, let me go back here. I've only got a few more minutes left. So if a branch breaks off halfway through the lift and you are there in a lift or in a bucket truck or in a climbing system, you're going to get crushed. So it's really important that when we make these lifting notches, we make them parallel to the ground, perpendicular to the branch. So in general, it's going to be shallow. So we got a little bit more meat to work with. Try to keep the notch same as you would be with folding any kind of, of notch or hinge. It should be symmetrical. Uh, that's a 45 degree notch actually. And so if we only needed to move it 45 degrees, we can use a 45. And so there's three real ways you can make it to the apex. You can use a traditional or a shelf cut, depending on what the scenario is. Uh, real quick, and I'll finish this up. This is that eight foot diameter tree. Uh, this is why multi-block rigging is really important. As you can see, that's a ton of wood to get out of there. This is over three buildings in a playground. Uh, so I went ahead and set up rigging as I'm moving through the tree. We've got a primary system in red that I use through the majority of the system, a secondary system that I used only when needed. Uh, that allowed me to have the ability to be able to move pieces of wood all through the tree. Now, if we're in the tree and we're utilizing the same kinds of systems that we were using earlier, this is very, very important. The second diagram to the right, as the piece of wood is being moved, the second block has a potential that the rope can go either over a chainsaw or over a climbing system. So it's really important 
that when we're adding a second block and we're out here working, that we place the rope on the opposite side of the wood. So that way, when the piece of wood goes over and down, this rope cleanly clears where we're at and doesn't rub against our lanyard or climbing line. Uh, also, if we had a, a scenario, this happened to me a lot in Florida, where I needed to remove the same pieces of wood. Uh, graph one, it's going down. Graph two, it's going to a different direction. I sometimes utilize a figure eight and a web sling with a secondary rope on this side. And then you can create an anchor for yourself. So if I'm running a scenario where I've got me as a climber and only one ground person and I need to be the second rigger, I can add a second anchor in the tree with me by using web slings, friction uh, systems of many different kinds. You can even put a different quarter wrap up there. There's a lot of things we can do. Remembering in most cases, a single block system uh, really stresses those compression fibers out on the tree, possibly creating a failure in the tree, uh, adding either fishing pole techniques or multi-block systems really works out well. Uh, what I always try to do is I maintain my tie-in point through the entire tree if I can, rigging as much as I can down, allowing me to be able to rotate pieces around and down. Uh, this, this particular photograph is working on moving the bigger pieces of wood. This is like 36 inches diameter or something like that. So I eventually would set up a secondary system so that way when this piece of wood came off, it didn't smash that building. Uh, I also work a lot on compromised trees. Don't be afraid to put in extra gear, even if you are unsure of is it needed or not? When you look at this, you go, is it needed or not? That's pretty clear cut, that's needed. If I even worry that I need to put in a, a binding strap on something, I just put one in because I carry several of them to the job. We calculated how much tensile strength we had holding this tree together while we rigged it down and it was 100,000 pounds tensile strength. So you can calculate how much strength you have. This is us rigging down this tree. The bad thing is if you do have to use systems that maintain a compromised tree, if you drop or rig into those systems, you can increase the dynamics causing a further failure to the tree that you are trying to protect. Uh, we're almost done. Speed lines, uh, very easy. You can throw a sling with a carabiner around a branch and send it down a rope. If you're doing it the more correctly way where you need to get the rope back, tandem pulleys, twist clevis, some kind of paw plate allows you to be able to run down the rope with a retriever line and then your load lines. Uh, what we found through testing is that speed lining, if you think about the most easy concept is I'm pulling the tree over with me in it. That's sort of the concept of speed lining. Those same forces that you generate by hooking the mini skid to it, pulling it over mechanical advantage can be created when you start adding weight into the middle of a rope. So uh, for efficiency, it's easier just to set the one rope up and let it go down. Uh, but some of the disadvantages are is that you end up increasing the load at the anchor point. Also, you are uh, bending the tree like a big pole. If you take, so if you look, this one goes directly to the top. We have 340 pounds at the anchor, 240 bottom anchor. We're compressing on the load side, lifting on the other side. If we take and move the top of the tree's rope down to the bottom, what we've done is we created a mechanical advantage and we increased the force where the climber or lift operator is at. So in most cases, by adding a rope from ground to the top of the tree to the bottom increases the load at the top. Going from the top to the bottom pulls the tree over. Going from the top to both sides as a 45 degree angle decreases load and compresses the tree into the ground. So if you do have to use a scenario where you're taking a gigantic piece of wood on a speed line system, you may want to back that speed line system up with the equivalent 45 degree angle. So that way you load the stem downwards and not over like you're pulling it over the mini skid. That's the same way that bridges are used. So there's a bunch of uh, data in there. 
As you can see, there's a lot of other stuff in here. I'm gonna go ahead and end so we can do some questions. I know that's a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, there's a question that says, what rope do you prefer to climb with? I climb mostly single rope and I climb on either uh, HTP or the uh, Scandiri. Those are the two that I climb on. Uh, the HTP, I love it because it's very little stretch. The Scandiri, I climb on it because it's a little fatter. And so it just depends on how fatigued I am. I normally use 10 millimeter HTP. I, and if I'm climbing for weeks on end, I'll switch over to a fatter rope. Okay, and were there more questions, anybody? Otis, that was amazing. Um, that's that's, that's Jesse, a lot of information, I know. It is, so. and, and that's why we have it. We're gonna, I'm gonna send you all an, an, an email, everybody that registered for this. Um, all 70 of you uh, to um, our web page where I've loaded this presentation as well as the video. Right now, the video is just on Facebook, but if you wait a day or two, I'll have it up um, on our web page as well. And um, I did want to mention that Jesse uh, Milton mentioned those illustrations are awesome. I thought so too. Did you make those? Yeah. So, Good job, I, man. so I made this presentation specifically to be distributed to the Georgia Arborist Association members. And I know that we have a population of arborists that do not speak English as a first language. So this is why my presentations don't have a lot of notes, but they're designed more as a pictogram of this is how I would like for you to do this while you're up there. Because what I've, I've found is it's sort of hard to come to show people these kinds of things if you're drawing it on the ground as a stick. But with this, you'll have access to this. You can have it on your phone. You should be able to pull it up. Like I know that I can open this on my iPhone. And then if I needed to show someone like, hey, while you're up there, we need to add some more blocks. Uh, I do gigantic rigging projects. People pay me to travel around the world. And normally it's only to do like gigantic rigging projects. This is something we could spend hours and hours and hours on. Whenever I was with Nats, this is an eight hour class. I know I went through this super, super fast, but I wanted to make sure that I gave enough information that when you utilize this to help train your own guys or gals in the field, you would sort of know the premise of what the picture stands for. And I hope that you guys are able to use this and use as a, some form of training tool, build on it, change it, put your own photographs in there, and utilize it for new crew members, use it for older crew members, whoever needs it. But I think that uh, Neil and I have chatted about like whenever I do something for the Georgia Arborist Association is I'd like for eventually for these to be CU qualifiers and that we'll, we'll come up with some way that you can use this presentation in the future to hopefully get CUs for it. Uh, I do lots of classes and I still struggle to get CUs. Uh, yeah, definitely. We're working on that. And um, I hope to have that up in the near future. Um, but yeah, so look for your email. I'll send it out to you all. I also asked for evaluation and other ideas for presentations. Um, you all, uh, if you stayed to this point, you'll all receive one CEU. Only if you attended the Zoom live, though. Unfortunately, that's the only way we can verify your presence. And um, Otis, any closing thoughts? One second here, I'm, I'm finally figured out how to do this chat thing and I'm just making sure there's no more questions here. Uh, so yeah, and definitely I'll, if you wanna help translate this, uh, Mr. Rivera, I would love to have that uh, because we'll, we're gonna make this open. Like I, I consider this the starting point as the Georgia Arborist Association public domain file. Uh, and that's why I didn't put it, there's, if you get this file and you open it, there's crane information in there. There's tree felling information in there. There's the data in there. And you really should be able to look at it very quickly. I only had an hour. That's why I flew through this. There's 170 uh, slides. I knew I wasn't going to make it. Uh, but I just wanted to let you guys know, like, it's there. You know, please use this at your, your benefit. If you want to translate it, feel free. I'd love to get a copy of that, too. Uh, and once you get it, unhide the slides, look at it. If you do a lot of crane work, there's a lot of good information in there on it. Uh, I hope you guys found this useful. Uh, 
I rig very simply. I just use lots of blocks and I go to town with it. Uh, if you're standing on the ground, you're not making it happen. A lot of people waste a lot of time. People pay me to show up and make it happen. So I bring the correct tools and I bring the correct attitude that if it can be done, I, I will make it get happen uh, in a safe, efficient way because my mindset is if it's standing there when I got there and it's not structurally unsound, I normally can get it done in a pretty quick fashion. So that's why people pay me and they know uh, I just don't destroy things. I don't take that chance. I would much rather rig something all the way to the ground than explain why I damaged something. Uh, so I hope this works out well for everybody. And if we don't have any more questions, I guess that's it for me. And anytime, guys, my name is Otis Sisk. It's greenprismconsulting.com. O-D-I-S at greenprismconsulting.com is my email. Feel free to shoot me uh uh, anything my phone number's on here you can call me i'm i'm just a tree guy like today i air spaded all day long cut grass got a shower and and then still made it in here for this so and then the rest of the week is cutting trees so i'm just a tree guy so if you ever need anything give me a shout thanks again otis you're awesome and uh we look forward to having otis also talking to, before uh, at our tree unitis conference in um in november November 10th through 14th. Make sure to put those dates aside and have a good night, everybody. Good night. Okay, thank you. Bye. Okay.